Stop. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the captivating ninth edition of the online lecture series, proudly hosted by the esteemed Physiological Society of India. Actually, uh, today there is a mishap. Uh, today morning at 6.40 a.m., we lost one of the stalwarts of the physiology, Dr. Sir Jogendra Mohan Tebnath. We have, a, we have lost a great teacher and well-wisher of physiology, as well as one of the visionaries of Vidyashagar University. He has an enormous contribution to the subject, curating students, writing books in the subject in vernacular etc may his soul rest in peace a few minutes silence for this pioneer respect so uh, our session launched on July 13, 2023. This series is designed to complement the curriculum of physiology courses at both undergraduate and postgraduate levels. Organized by the Educational Committee of the Physiological Society of India, these lectures are scheduled on the fourth Saturday of each month during the evening session from 7 to 9 p.m. Tonight's lecture, the ninth in the series, delves into the intricate workings of the human nervous system. Today's enthralling topic will be illuminated by two luminaries in the field. It gives me such an immense pleasure to announce the esteemed presence of our distinguished speakers who are undoubtedly the epitome of knowledge and expertise. With bated breath, we await the insightful words from Professor Shuchitra Sachin Palve and Professor Shumita Bhoghosh. In the first session, we have the privilege of delving into the realm of sensory nervous system under the erudite guidance of Professor Shuchitra Sachin Palve. Professor Shuchitra Sachin Palve, an esteemed medical professional, has expertise in neurophysiology, medical education, and exercise physiology. She earned her MBBS and uh, MD in physiology and is a certified surgical neurophysiologist currently pursuing a PhD in medical physiology. Notable Achievements include a patent for a digital hand grip dynamometer, copyrights for innovative teaching methods, and co authorship of a practical physiology handbook. Recognized as the outstanding researcher in neurophysiology at the fourth Venice International Healthcare Awards, she is also authoring a forthcoming book titled Comprehensive Guide for early clinical exposure for medical undergraduates. Proficient in NCV testing, EMG, and EEG, Professor Palve has contributed significantly to 30 publications in international and national peer-reviewed journals. Currently serving as a professor at the Graphic Era Institute of Medical Sciences, she has over 14 years of postgraduate experience Professor Palve has held key roles such as professor and head at Symbiosis Medical College for Women and MEU coordinator for around four years, actively contributing to curriculum development. Her leadership in medical education, administration, and groundbreaking research underscores her distinction in the medical field. Madam, you may now commence your session. The platform is yours to lead. Well, thank you, Sahita, for such a lovely introduction. Uh, and I would like to thank the Physiological Society of India also 
for giving me this opportunity to share my views regarding the very important topic and that is the central nervous system so uh, to begin we all know that uh, nervous system since ancient era was an important topic like an uh, what to say interesting topic where everybody was researching and most of us found lot of physiological functions also regard uh, of the central nervous system and many of the uh, things were uh, found by the scientists specifically related to nervous system as compared to different other parts of the body but you can understand the importance of nervous system that still we are lagging behind what actually persists or what actually is there in the nervous system so this makes the central nervous system more interesting for us to study so the topic given to me today is to just introduce you all regarding the sensory neurophysiology but what's the fun if we don't start something by not knowing what are the objectives which we are going to cover so what we are going to cover in today's session is we are just going to classify what is nervous system after that we will be classifying what is peripheral nervous system followed by which we will be dwelling in the overview of what actually we are going to see regarding the sensory homunculus followed by the functional units of the nervous system where i will be briefly discussing regarding the neurons and axons and how they are really important for the functioning of the nervous system then again i'll be giving a brief overview of synapse how it is important for actually helping out for us then uh, we are going to talk about the receptors again it will be an overview followed by actually what are the sensory tracts so to begin with some humor Shh, listen to that it smells like blue what will happen if same thing happen with us that you are going to smell blue definitely there will be a sensory confusion syndrome and that is what we don't want in our life and that's how it makes us more intrigating for us to understand actually what is central nervous system so basically if we want to talk about overall functions of the nervous system then we must know that whatever information or whatever things that are present in the environment or whatever changes that are happening in our body our central nervous system or the nervous system tries to gather this information in the form of sensory input then it takes it to the brain at the level of higher center where it processes it where it integrates it matches the information with the previous experiences and sends its feedback via motor signals in the form of motor output if we have to take example let us think that you saw a beautiful flower what will be your response you will try to either pluck it or you will try to smell it so what is the sensory input here is your vision what will be the processing you will think that you have already seen this flower before and then you will try to pluck the flower with your hand and that is nothing but the motor response which is generated by your brain which you have applied by plucking the flower now if you can see in this picture there are multiple uh, multiple things that are working when we have to process some information number one is your sensory receptor which is working as a sensory input then the higher centers which are working as the integrator mechanisms at the level of your brain or central nervous system followed by the motor responses in the form of motor output so the sensory input and the motor output they constitute a different system the brain where the central information is getting processed and integrated it forms a different system while the organs which are creating the responses they form a different system so all this system they are different but they are integrating together they are processing together and they are functioning together in order to generate the desired response 
so what is the function of this system what is the function of this system and what is the function of this system we are going to learn step wise in future classes now first let us concentrate on what are the generalized classification or what are the functional organization of this nervous system as i said that there are different levels at which information which goes into the body it gets processed and just uh, to interrupt ma'am we yes. cannot go see your slides can you please share your screen so when we have to functionally classify the nervous system we can classify it as a central nervous system and peripheral nervous system now this central nervous system can be again divided into brain and spinal cord followed by the peripheral nervous system which actually consists of the nerves that are connecting all the body parts to the brain as i already told you there is a processing unit where all the information is processed which consists of the brain and spinal cord and there is some system which actually carries the information towards this processing unit and this is what we are going to talk in today's class and specifically we are going to deal with the sensory division of this information now when we are dividing or functionally organizing this peripheral nervous system we can see that there are two divisions one is sensory division and one is motor division now specifically if we have to see the sensory division this sensory nervous system actually is concerned with carrying the information from the external environment or from the different parts of body as i already told you now which kind of sensations these nervous system is going to carry either in the form of general sensations because they are going to be carried either from the skin or from the subcutaneous tissue and that is the reason why we call them as general sensations there is something called as special senses also where the sensations or the sensations which are being perceived by specific specialized receptors which are present in the special part of our, of our body if we have to talk about special senses in the beginning we can talk about vision we can talk about hearing we can uh, talk about taste sensations we can talk about olfactory sensation because these sensations are confined to the specific part of your body they are not coming from any general part of the body if we have to talk about general sensation or if we have to differentiate them from the special sensations these general sensations usually they are coming from the superficial part or either they are coming from the deeper part of the body so what are the superficial sensations which we can perceive they can be in the form of touch they can be in the form of pain they can be in the form of variations in the temperature now if we have to talk about deep sensations you can either perceive them in the form of pain or in the form of deep touch pressure or any sense of position any sense of movement or any sense of vibration but what is more concern about this deep sensation is the sense of proprioception and that is the reason why these general senses are more concerned about the proprioception so what is proprioception i hope you have learned it but let us briefly revise what is proprioception it is nothing but the sense of position 
or sense of locomotion. Wherever your body changes the position, the receptors or the sensory inputs which are present in different parts of your joints and muscles, they will make your higher centers aware about the changes that are happening in the position of your body. Okay. So this is the basic difference between the general senses which are perceived by your body and also the special senses which are perceived by your body. So if we have to revise it again, general senses are coming from the superficial part of the body or superficial skin or subcutaneous tissue. Special senses are coming from the specialized organs like your eyes, your ears, your nose, your tongue. Now, one thing you should remember that tongue has got both general and special sensations because it has a special sensation to understand the taste of different organs, but it also manifests the general sensation which includes the changes that are happening in the temperature. And that's why we can tell that the food is hot or cold. Okay. So this is very important for us. Then it can also sense the temperature variations. That is very important. Now, when we have to classify this sensory sensation, very important sensations that a person perceives is a visceral sensation. Now, viscera, I hope you all are aware, viscera is nothing but the sensations that are being coming from the internal organs. So, which are your internal organs? Let us take an example. Can you feel any internal organ? No, definitely. But you can feel the movement sometimes unless they are quite more. Like you can feel the movements, peristaltic movements when they become abnormal. But normally you can't feel the peristaltic movements. Then there are some other things which are happening in the body in the form of visceral sensations like your heart is beating, you are breathing. So these are some changes that happen or that are confined to take place in your viscera or internal organs. So again, they can be divided into general visceral sensation and special visceral sensation. But one thing we should remember that unless something becomes abnormal in this sensation, one cannot have a conscious, uh, what to say, awareness about this sensation. So what are the special or general sensation, visceral sensations one can be aware of? That is pain. Either somebody hits someone. So at that time you feel the pain in the abdomen. Somebody knocks you down. So that is some kind of pain. If you are extremely hungry, you get that hunger pangs in your abdomen. So that is something called as general visceral sensation, you, which you perceive in the form of pain. Then there is some extreme thirst or temperature variations are there that might also cause general visceral sensations in your body. Now, what are special visceral senses? Again, as I told, it may be confined to taste or smell. Now, let us take an example of superficial sensations or we can say generalized sensation. Suppose there is a pinprick to your finger. So what is going to happen whenever there is a pinprick to your finger? The information is going through a specialized system which is known as receptor which is followed into your different parts of the nervous system. It goes to your spinal cord which is followed again to your brain. Now, one thing here I want to clear is not all the information which is processed or which you receive, it is going to your brain. Now, understand one thing. You are sensing the pinprick sensation. But are you aware of the heart that is beating in your body? Are you always aware of the fact that you are breathing no. So that makes one important component for us to understand or for one, uh, one component for us to discuss. And that is, what are the sensations that actually we are conscious of? And what are the sensations we are actually are not conscious of? So anything 
which we actually have to deal with in emergency situations where like as i give the example that there is a pin prick so in this situation we have to remove our hand immediately so we actually are aware about this sensation and we know that we need to get rid of this sensation so this information needs to be processed at a particular area of the brain where i need to be conscious about so this makes us to realize that there are some higher centers which are present in our brain which actually makes us aware about these kind of sensations so when we have to understand this we need to understand a very important component in the brain and that is the structure of the different parts of the brain and this will connect us to the next segment of our topic that is sensory homunculus now as i told you there is a pin prick let us take a example now the information about this pin prick has reached my spinal cord now i still i am not aware that i have a pin prick now this information goes slowly to my brain stem assuming that you people know that there are different parts of the brain which comes the information is going up now now when it comes up to your brain stem and then when it reaches to your cerebral cortex i hope you all know this is a cerebral cortex so this area is known as cerebral cortex so you know the cortex is made up of cell bodies we will talk about the neurons later on where i'll be talking about different cell bodies when they come together how they form the superior layer of the cerebral cortex now this cerebral cortex is divided into two segments with the help of central sulcus now the area which is in front is known as precentral gyrus and the area which is behind the central sulcus is known as postcentral gyrus now this postcentral gyrus is the area of interest for us whenever any kind of sensory information is processed in the brain because what happens here is whatever information is coming where the brain or where our body is actually in a need for any kind of conscious information is processed in this area so the area of interest for us whenever we are concerned about any sensations that are coming from external environment either or from different parts of our body it is going to get processed in this part of the cerebral cortex so which is this part again let me repeat this is the post central gyrus or your somato sensory cortex now this somato sensory cortex will analyze this information and it will store it in the form of map as a visual map where it will going to process and integrate this information now how it is going to store this information in how it will integrate this information based on the fact that there is this kind of information is already stored in the somato sensory cortex now this information is already stored in the sensory cortex or your somato sensory cortex in different parts of the cortex or different areas of this somato sensory cortex so how we are going to know which part of body is having the stored information in which part of the area of the somato sensory cortex it is based on the sensory homunculus so what is this sensory homunculus actually demonstrate it demonstrate the area of the cortex which is specifically dedicated to the sensations of various body parts and it will also precisely tell you that how proportional to the uh, area is actually sensitive to the different parts of the body like as i said if i have a pin prick to my finger definitely the most central portion of my cerebral cortex is going to get stimulated because if you can see the area is having a maximum representation here in my somato sensory cortex so when we have to talk about 
sensory homunculus or when we have to briefly understand what is sensory homunculus it is a topographical representation of different parts of the body in order to perceive in order to uh, map the information in order to execute the processing of the sensory information now i am not going to go in detail regarding the sensory homunculus what is important for us to understand is any kind of sensory information when it comes from the superficial part of the body or from the subcutaneous level it will be processed at the higher level but when we are talking about other information like as i said your heart beats or there is a change in the respiratory rate or there is a peristaltic movements we are not always aware of these sensations and why is it so because these kinds of sensations they are not perceived in our cerebral cortex of course they are processed later on but the initial level where they are going to process is our brain stem i hope you know the different parts of brain stem where the information related to different unconscious sensation is going to get perceived like taking an example if i have to speak about the changes that are happening in your heart rate or blood pressure the information is going to the medulla along with that even the changes that are happening in your respiratory rate the information is again processed in the level of your pons and medulla okay so again this is a topographical representation which is your sensory homunculus you can see most medially is the lower part of the body that is represented and the muscles which are requiring more skill or the muscles that are having more work like the muscles of facial expression or the fingers which we use often for any kind of skillful work these kind of parts of the body are having maximum representation in your sensory homunculus so i will not go in detail about sensory homunculus now let us proceed ahead now the information is coming from the external environment again i will begin like that and this information is carried via the neurons which are coming and executing the responses now this makes us more uh, what to say dive into the knowledge and makes us more aware that we should know more regarding the functional unit of nervous system and to understand functional unit of nervous system that is the neuron we must understand the structure of the neuron so basically i think that we all are aware about the structure of neurons because it is already taught at the school level also and it is already taught in the uh, 12th class also so unlike other cells it has got a cell body then it has got a nucleus but the difference is presence of dendrites followed by an exon which is a process of this cell so this is something unique which makes this neuron different than other type of cells so how many neurons are there in the body i hope you all are aware there are around 100 millions of neurons in the body so do you think this 100 millions of neurons they are connected with each other just like that or they are just floating and how this information processes through one neuron to the other neuron of course it is not a work of one neuron to carry the information from one part of the body to the central nervous system definitely there has to be the connection of neurons which will take the information right from where the site of injury is there or the site of stimulus is there to the central portion of the brain now before going ahead one must know that whenever these neurons collectively come together they will form a precise section of your brain or they will form a very important component of your brain and that is something called as gray matter so one must remember this thing that there is a specific difference between a gray matter and white matter in your brain so what makes a gray matter is collection of cell bodies when this cell bodies come together they will form gray matter and when the exons 
or when there are bundles of exons that are formed together they will form the white matter so this is something which you should remember and we are going to talk about it more ahead when we will talk about the tracks but you should know that whenever the cell bodies are collected together they will form a gray matter and whenever this exons will come together few exons collection of exons they will form a white matter okay so brain has got gray matter and white matter that you should remember then there are other cells also apart from uh, neurons that are present in your brain and these cells are known as glial cells of course they are not carrying the information unlike neurons but they will be helping or they will be supporting the neurons in carrying out their functioning so again i'll not go in detail about this glial cells now as i told you already that neurons they are 100 millions right so if one neuron has to pass the information to other neurons like there has to be a chain of this neurons which are processing the information from one end to the other end so how this information is going to get cross from one neuron to other neuron when they will have formation of synapse so what is synapse it is nothing but the site of contiguity where there is a specialized junction that is created between the two neurons which will permit the electrical communication that will happen between these two neurons okay so specifically we can say that the information which is present with one neuron can be passed to the next neuron now again as i said we will be just having an overview of everything in the form of an aerial view so here we are just going to classify the synapses as i already do what is synapse is the junction between the two neurons so definitely there has to be an anatomical difference between the neurons definitely the neurons are not same or the same kind of neurons that are present in each part of the body so whenever there is some connection it can happen at any level so there are different types of classification based on the connections that will happen between the two neurons so there might happen that one exon of neuron may connect with the dendrite so there will be a exodendritic connection one exon might connect with the soma of other neuron so there might be a exosomatic connection one exon may connect of one neuron to the other exon so there might be an exoexonal connection or there might be a dendrodendritic connection where the two neurons will connect with each other so this is anatomical classification what is more interesting for us is functional classification or physiological classification which is based on the type of synapse or what type of response that is generated between the two synapses so most of the common type of this synapse which is chemical synapse seen in our central nervous system followed by the electrical synapse so what is chemical synapse again it is a specialized type of synapse which is based on the release of a neurotransmitter so most of the synapses that are present in our central nervous system are chemical uh, type of synapses where a specialized neurotransmitter is released and which will help in changing the membrane permeability of the other neuron and which will generate the action potential based on the neurotransmitter that is released i hope you know that there are different neurotransmitters which are present at the synapses or at the level of the uh, neurons it may be excitatory it may be inhibitory in nature so based on that the other neuron will process the information or it will inhibit the information electrical synapses will actually work based on the presence of gap junctions where the voltage gated channels will be present and accordingly they will change the membrane permeability but one must remember or one must specifically remember here that the number of chemical synapses are more in our central nervous system as compared to the electrical synapses so this is very important for us to remember here the next important thing what we must remember in the sensory receptors is the presence of receptor itself 
Now, what are receptors? Receptors, if we have to define, are the specialized or modified sensory nerves or epithelial endings which undergoes depolarization in response to a specific stimuli. Like as I said, whenever there is a pinprick sensation, you are having something at the skin which is going to change and that response is going to generate or that response is taken up by your different nerves and which will be taking ahead or which this information will be taken ahead in the form of response towards your spinal cord or towards your brain. So actually, whatever receptors that are present, they are going to act as a biological transducers. Now, functionally, these receptors or sensory receptors, which are going to receive the information, basically, these are the recipients which are present either on the superficial parts of the body or from wherever the information is going to get seen. So this information can be generalized whenever it comes from the different parts of the body. It can be specialized when it comes from special parts of the body. So let us talk first about functional classification when we have to classify this sensory receptors. It can come from the superficial part of the body. As I said, they can be nociceptors like pain receptors, there may be thermoreceptors which are coming or which are related to your temperature sensations. There might be chemoreceptors which are confined to the changes that are happening in the pH or mechanoreceptors, specifically changes that are occurring in your body or responding to the changes in your body against the pressure. So based on that, they are divided. So these are specialized nerve endings. When we have to talk about pain receptors, there are different nerve endings which are present throughout on the surface of the body. They might be a type A fiber receptors, might be there are type C fibers which are present, which can carry the pain sensation. So free nerve endings are there, thermoreceptors are there, which are specifically designed for sensing the changes that are happening in the temperature. There are specific chemoreceptors. Actually, we should uh, be aware of this, which sense the changes that are happening in either your pH, either the blood pressure, either that the changes that are happening in the heart rate. So one might remember uh, the aortic bodies, then the carotid sinus bodies that are present, which will sense these changes. Then there are baroreceptors also, which you should remember. So it's very important that we must be aware regarding the receptors because these are the preliminary uh, sense organs which are going to perceive the sensory information and they are going to process it ahead. So again, the properties and all we are going to discuss later on. But one thing we must remember is that different types of sensory receptors are going to respond in different forms. Like if we have to talk about chemical uh, stimulus or chemoreceptors, any kind of chemical stimulus is going to change the membrane potential. And again, the membrane potential response will be in the form of changing the permeability of the membrane. Same thing, mechanoreceptors, whenever there is change in pressure, again, there will be change in membrane potential. Again, when we have to talk about photoreceptors, which are specific receptors that are present in your eyes. So there will be a signal transduction based on which there will be change in the membrane permeability for different ions and followed by which there will be change in the membrane potential, followed by which there is a signaling that will be sent to your integrating centers. So different types of receptors will respond to the different sensations and there will be different kind of processing that will be happening at each type of receptor. That is what you should remember that this point. Actually, there are different properties of this receptor also. But uh, since this topic is only confined to the superficial aspect of sensory nervous system, we are not going in detail about this. Now, uh, Let's see what are the different tracts or what is actually a tract. I hope you remember when I was talking about neurons, 
we spoke that there are cell bodies and there are exons which are forming different kind of structures so whenever we are collecting different cell bodies of neurons they are forming a gray matter but whenever we are collecting the exons together they will form a white matter now what happens is this white matter if we have to see this white matter or this exons may run either cephalocaudally or they may run anteroposteriorly or they may run from lateral to the medial end also okay or from right to left side also so the information which is carried by this exons or the group of exons from cephalic end to the caudal end or from the caudal end to the cephalic end i hope you know what is cephalic from brain and caudal means lower part of the body so any information which comes from cephalic end to the caudal end from this group of exons forms a track and any information which is going from the caudal end to the cephalic end via the group of exons again it forms a track so what is track if you have to summarize it is a collection of exons which are carrying the information either from the cephalic end or either from the caudal end so in our case the information regarding any kind of sensory response it is going from the caudal end to the cephalic end and that constitutes the sensory tract so what is tract tract is a collection of exons or uh, tracts is a collection of white matter which is carrying the fibers either cephalically or either caudally so in case of sensory tract the information or the sensory information is going from the spinal cord to your brain so that's why it is known as ascending tract because it goes from down to up to your cerebral cortex the information when it comes from the cerebral cortex down to any effector organ it is called as motor response even these tracts are known as descending tracts so the tracts which take the information up are ascending tracts or the group of exons which are forming a white matter which are collecting the information makes the ascending tracts the information when it comes in the form of response it will be the motor tract so this is very important for us to remember here collection of exons or collection of white matter carrying the information up is your ascending track or sensory track now let us dissect how the information is going related to any kind of sensation that is happening i hope you remember we have seen that there are different sensations what we perceive do you remember i okay let us see let us recollect the information or what kind of senses we can perceive we can perceive touch we can perceive pain we can perceive pressure we can perceive proprioception or change in the position of joint followed by a different sensation like two point discrimination fine touch pain pressure okay let us not dig into the nitty gritty of this but when this information has to process up how this information is going up in the form of ascending track so how this track is formed we are going to just have a overview of this again this when this information is processed it is processed in the three order pathway i hope you know what is pathway we are digging actually a map that how this information is going up now any information when it is we are talking about sensory concerns it is actually processed at the preliminary level or at the level of your sensory neurons which is again arise from the external receptors which travel through the dorsal roots of the spinal cord okay now from here the information is taken up by the tracks as i already told you these are the collection of exons which are bundled up together and from there it will go to the uh, from that level of spinal cord to the brain stem and from there from the brain stem 
it will be carried to the different parts of your central nervous system like your thalamus then followed by which there will be your primary somato sensory cortex again some kind of information can be followed ahead into your internal capsule also now specifically when we are talking about sensory tracts or the tracts which are carrying the information from different parts of the body to your brain or the ascending tracts we must remember that there are two important tracts one might not forget in their life and what are these two tracts number one is your dorsal column medial lamical system and second one is your anterolateral system now you might see that i have put some annotations like modern senses and something called as primitive senses so why i am saying this that this is something concerned with the modern senses or this is something concerned with the primitive senses it is because this dorsal column medial lamical system is far advanced kind of system of signal reception and perception at the level of your brain as compared to the anterolateral system which is primitive that means that this anterolateral system was discovered quite long back as compared to the dorsal column medial lamical system then if we have to talk about the nerve fibers which are carrying the information via this dorsal column medial lamical system the nerves which are carrying the information via this pathway is highly myelinated i hope you know the difference between the myelinated and non myelinated fibers the myelinated fibers usually carry the information at the faster rate as compared to the nerve fibers which are non myelinated or moderately myelinated then that is the reason whatever sensations are carried by this dorsal column medial lamical system will be perceived at a faster rate as compared to the system that is carried by the anterolateral system the conduction velocity definitely it will be higher whenever we are talking about dorsal lamical system because of the highly myelinated fiber as compared to the anterolateral system which is quite slower due to the non myelination there will be better localization and better gradation of sensation when the information is carried via this dorsal column medial lamical system as compared to the anterolateral system where there will be a poor localization and diffuse gradations of responses at the higher levels now what kind of sensations are carried by this dorsal column medial lamical system such we can think of modern sensations why we are saying modern sensation because these sensations were actually gradually uh, perceived by the humans when they actually advanced or when they actually evolved so what are these modern sensations sense of proprioception that is a locomotion sense or the sense of position of the joint then fine touch sense of vibration so all these sensations are modern sensations which are perceived by humans when they evolved then what are anterolateral sensations usually these are primitive sensation which a man was feeling or which a human was feeling before the evolution also or as they evolved also they processed it and it is a longer time of uh, what to say process which everyone feels it so it is uh, if we have to talk about primitive sensations we can say uh, these sensations are pain sensations or temperature sensation or crude touch sensations these we are sensing these sensations are sensed by everyone right from the primitive era and that's why these are known as primitive sensations so if we have to structurally see how these tracts look then we can have a diagrammatic view let us take a example of mechanoreceptors or proprioceptors we can see the first order neurons the neurons will carry the information in your spinal cord followed by which the information goes in your brain stem in the dorsal column nuclei where the neurons will terminate and there will be origin of second order neurons there will be one important thing that we should remember that the second order neurons when they form 
they are going to decussate on the opposite side and this is one again very important thing that you should remember regarding the dorsal column medial laminiscal system and again these uh, tracts they are going to go straight into the thalamus followed by which the information goes into your primary somatosensory cortex so this is regarding the dorsal column medial laminiscal system so what is happening here is the information goes into the spinal cord straight into the medulla and the decussation happens at the level of your brain stem followed by which the information again goes to the thalamus followed by the somatosensory cortex the detail about the tracks you are going to learn again in the consecutive classes but for an overview i have told that this is how the dorsal column medial laminiscal system is going to process the information regarding the modernized sensation now when we are talking about anterolateral system the basic difference between these two systems you can make out from the diagram itself see the receptors when they receive the information they are going to come into the spinal cord but there will be decussation immediately at the level of spinal cord itself and then the processing of information happens in the similar format as we have seen in the dorsal column medial laminiscal system okay so again as i said i am not going to go in detail regarding the different tracks because this tracks will be again covered in other segment of the class so one must remember that either it is anterolateral system or either it is dorsal column medial laminiscal system the information is always going first to your thalamus followed by the somatosensory cortex or our post central gyrus where we have a mapping of different parts or different areas of the body where we have a topographic representation of the body where we can correlate and based on that your brain will generate a response or where it will generate a tactics in the manner how the body needs to work related to the response okay so what thy brain sees so this is something what our brain sees in our homunculus i hope you recollect we have maximum representation for the face lips and the fingers and this is what is the motor homunculus which is quite different which will be again discussed in the next section of the class so let us briefly recapitulate what we learnt in today's class so what we saw in our segment or what we saw in today's classes we just highlighted what are the functions of nervous system followed by we classified the peripheral nervous system where we again classified sensory nervous system into general sensation and special senses these general senses again we classified as uh, which are coming from the superficial part of the body or general sensation and which are coming again from the special sensory organs then we again spoke about visceral sensations followed by that we spoke about how these sensations are perceived at the level of our somatosensory cortex in the form of topographical representation that is your sensory homunculus followed by this we spoke regarding the functions of neurons how the information is carried via new one neuron to the other neuron in the form of synapse followed by which we also discussed regarding the signal transducers of the brain which are actually the recipients of the information that is your receptors followed by which we again spoke regarding the different tracks which are carrying this information via brain i hope this session was understood by you i again thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present my views regarding the sensory nervous system thank you so much if you have any questions or queries uh, i would like the the audience to type them or you can mail me on my mail thank you so much
thank you immensely professor suchitra sachin palve ma'am for an outstanding presentation your eloquent elucidation of the sensory nervous system was truly mesmerizing enchanting and enlightening your descriptive mastery painted a vivid picture bringing the intricacies of the subject to life with clarity and allure thank you so much ma'am for your valuable you. time and your wonderful presentation thank you madam okay so we have reached our next session uh, in the second phase of this lecture series it is with great enthusiasm that i introduce to you our esteemed speaker professor shumita bhu ghosh who will enlighten us with his expertise on the intricacies of the motor nervous system please join me in welcoming professor ghosh to the platform professor shumita bhu ghosh did his post graduation from calcutta university and phd from department of physiology institute of medical sciences banaras hindu university he joined kasturba medical college mangalore and taught for 20 years before moving to malaysia where he taught in three different medical colleges for about 19 years besides being a regular examiner in his parent institutions he acted as an external examiner to various universities in karnataka kerala and tamil nadu and three universities in malaysia he takes interest in research and medical education he guided msc md and phd students published papers attended conferences and presented papers chaired sessions and delivered talks as invited guest in symposiums and he participated in the curriculum development of undergraduate and postgraduate courses as well as country construction of pbl and tbl packages delivered talks as invited guest in symposiums and conferences and chaired sessions sir i would like to request you to start your session please and the mic is over to you and uh, thank you sangeeta let me try to project my slides okay sir is my slide visible now uh, yes sir uh, but it should be in the presentation mode okay, okay. thank you is it all right now yeah it's okay it's visible now thank you sir okay Uh, firstly thank you sangeeta for giving the introduction my introduction uh, and uh, from my part i am very much happy to present to all of you i i am very much grateful very much thankful to physiological society of india for giving me this opportunity to uh interact with the students and uh, i hope this session will be helpful because this gives the introduction to the motor system and uh, it may be a vast subject 
but I'll be, I'm trying to cover them uh, with as much simplicity as possible. Uh, and I welcome all of you who are listening to me right now. Uh, let me let me start with my topic. Now, as you can see, this is the general motor system. Uh, actually, there, there, there are motor system which is under our control and the motor system which is not in our control. What does it mean? All the movements which we do with our wish, whatever we want to wish, or oh, sorry, whatever we wish and do the movements. For example, we move from one place to another. I get up from the chair or I, or I sit down on the chair or I write something on the paper. All these things I am doing with my own will. And that is the topic of today, how we do it. Another motor system is there, which is not in our control. That is known as autonomic nervous system. Actually, there are muscles like smooth muscles. And the smooth muscle contractions are controlled by the autonomic nervous system. Actually, we do not even get to know about such functions. The smooth muscles of your digestive system, the intestine, for example, intestinal movement happens without our will. Whether we want it or do not want it, we cannot do anything about it. Similarly, uh, Vesoconstriction, you know about vesoconstriction, vesodilatation. They are also because of contraction or relaxation of the smooth muscles, and they are also not in our control. So today's today's uh, the whole session is dedicated to the general motor system or what we call somatic motor system. Let us see what are the points we are going to cover. So learning objectives, it includes the differentiation. We should be able to, or we would be able to differentiate between the sensory and motor nerves and sensory and motor tracts. Secondly, what is very important, we have to identify upper motor neuron and lower motor neurons. Thirdly, the pathways of pyramidal and extra pyramidal pathways, these are the motor tracts. Describe the function of pyramidal and extra pyramidal tracts. Then we must know about the reflexes and their importance in the assessment of the motor system. Then there are many structures which are involved in the motor activities. So these, uh, you know, in the brain, we have cerebral cortex, cerebellum, basal ganglia, vestibular apparatus. And we'll see how do they contribute. And lastly, we should know about the effect of lesion of motor areas. So these are the learning outcomes. OK, so this one we have already talked about. Function of general motors, motor system or somatic motor system is movement by contraction of skeletal muscles. And it is under our voluntary control. This is different from the autonomic nervous system, which is not in our voluntary control. 
Now all these functions are accomplished by nerve connections. So we have nerves and the tracts. Okay. So just now you heard about the sensory nerves, sensory tracts, and uh, you know I have also heard the presentation. So Dr. Suchitra has really made my work easier. In her beautiful presentation, she has vividly described about uh, the sensory systems and when you compare the sensory system side by side with motor system uh, you'll be able to understand both of them far better <clears throat> so one of my slides i have kept on the sensory nerves and ascending tracts so this is just a recapitulation of what you have heard just now so sensory nerves originate from the receptors of skin, muscle, joints, etc. They carry sensory impulses to central nervous system. Once inside the central nervous system, they synapse with another set of neurons. <clears throat> and that constitute the ascending tracts. And these carry impulses to the cerebral cortex. And if they reach the cerebral cortex, then only there will be conscious sensation. So if they do not reach the cerebral cortex, for example, if they reach cerebellum, like spinocerebellar tract, these will be known as unconscious sensation. Now, these are called ascending tracts because Cerebral cortex lies at the top of the brain and in a uh, erect posture when you are standing at that time the impulses that is carried by the sensory nerve to inside the central nervous system must ascend, must move in upward direction to reach the cortex. So therefore these are ascending tracks. Now you can understand about the descending tracts because descending tracts all start from the cerebral cortex. Only difference with the ascending tract is ascending tract will start at uh, or, or terminate. Ascending tracts will terminate in the cortex in the sensory area. But as descending tracts will start from the cortex itself from the motor area, okay? So these are descending because from the cortex, from the top portion, it is coming to various level of our body. The impulses originate in the cerebral cortex and descend or move downwards through the motor or descending tracts. You can see we are using two terms. One is tract, another is nerve. Uh, as a matter of fact, nerves are present in the peripheral nervous system, not inside the central nervous system. This is a bunch of neurons which run together to form nerve. Or rather, we should say a bunch of axons, the long, you know, processes, the long, long process of the neuron. When they are running together in a bundle, then it is called nerve. When the same thing happens inside the central nervous system, then we call it tract. So whenever we refer to tracts, then you, you must understand that this is inside the central nervous system. Whenever we tell you nerve, that means it is in the periphery, not inside the central nervous system. So all the descending tracts, they descend from the cerebral cortex 
and uh, then they will terminate in two areas either in the you know head region itself that means in the brain it can emerge out of, out of the brain in that case they are known as cranial nerves so the cranial nerves which come out they are known as nerves or lower motor neuron similarly from all the levels of the spinal cord the spinal nerves will come out and these motor spinal nerve are again uh, they are the lower motor neurons which are the upper motor neurons upper motor neurons are the tracts which remain inside the central nervous system we'll talk more about it a little later now this slide says the organization of motor system this is in the heart of this lecture this is all the motor system does if you are asked what is the function of the motor system we'll be seeing uh, it in this particular slide so somatic motor activity is due to discharge of the cranial motor nerves and the spinal motor nerves which are the final common path to skeletal muscle because either the motor nerves or the or the spinal nerves they are ultimately going to innervate the muscle which are going to move so therefore they are known as final common path now the final common path they get inputs where from they they get it from descending pathways from the cerebral cortex we'll be discussing more about it a little later cerebral cortex midbrain and medulla then they get inputs from the spinal neurons the spinal neurons of the same segment and from the adjacent segments so intersegmental connections are also there and peripheral afferents which are the peripheral afferents in the earlier lecture you have heard about the uh, you know sensory nerves when they enter inside the central nervous system they give one collateral to the uh, alpha motor neuron which is the origin of the motor nerve in each of the spinal segment so all the motor nerves they give they get one input from the sensory nerve so they are known as peripheral afferents now these inputs in the final common path sub sub three functions so i i told you what are the three major functions whenever we move how it happens there are three things one is that this final common path will bring about the voluntary activity desired volunteer voluntary activity and while this voluntary activity will uh, continue at that time they will adjust the posture and provide stable background for movement this is very very important uh, for example if if you are asked to pass a thread through the eye of a needle while walking it's very difficult isn't it first you have to uh, secure a position a, a stable posture then your fine movements will be possible so that means for every fine movement you need to uh, you know precisely 
adjust your posture and equilibrium. So this is also done by the final common path. And lastly, it coordinates the action of various muscles to make the movement smooth and pre precise. For example, you are writing something and to make it smooth and precise that are many groups of muscles are contracting in sequence at a particular you know range uh, or at particular rate uh, in particular direction with particular force so all these things must be coordinated and that is also the function of the motor system so this this might be uh, all these last functions is being done by many parts of the brain that we'll see later now we are starting from the the most important structure that is the cerebral cortex so as you have seen in the sensory system there are ascending tracts here there are descending tracts what are the major descending tracts there are two of them one is corticospinal another is corticobulbar these are direct descending pathway so there are direct pathways and indirect pathways direct pathways is corticospinal tract the other name is pyramidal tract with the name you can understand corticospinal that means it starts from the cortex and ends in the spinal cord so it is a group of single neurons originating from the motor cortex extending to the spinal motor neurons single neurons means there is only one neuron which will start from there and ultimately it will continue till the spinal cord of different levels so this bunch of neurons bunch of neurons they are not short they are very long you can imagine from the top of your brain when it goes to the last spine the length will be measured in meters isn't it so you may say the longest the longest you know cell in your body and normally it is a two you know this direct pathway it is a two neuronal pathway first neuron will start from the cortex and the second neuron will come out of the central nervous system so first one as we told it was corticospinal tract second one is corticobulbar tract it starts from the cortex and ends on the cranial nerve nuclei that means from here it will come out as cranial nerves so discharge in these fibers will control the fine movement in the distal part of the extremities as well as face head and neck second group of descending tracts are indirect pathway these are the extra pyramidal tract which a multi synaptic pathway this is not you know two neuronal pathway it is multi synaptic pathway originating from motor cortex as corticonuclear tract and stimulate various brain stem nuclei and from there the extra pyramidal tract will originate and they regulate the medial group of anterior horn cells to execute gross movement and maintain muscle tone and posture see here certain things which has been told which will be repeated 
because we know in the first utterance when we tell tell you for the first time it may not be very very much understandable so we have told two things one is the medial group medial group of anterior horn cells these are the motor horn, horn cells of the spinal cord medial group is innervated by extrapyramidal tract and what are their functions gross movement muscle tone posture so this will be repeatedly told to you whereas the direct pathways they are responsible they they mainly are responsible for the movement in the distal part that means in the hand for example the distal part of the limbs okay hand or feet and also in the head region and these are very fine precise movements so right now we have heard about the medial group and uh, this one is of lateral group we'll see it again later now this particular diagram uh, is very familiar to you and this is the cerebral cortex as you can see there are four lobes four colors are there what is very important i'll draw your attention to this groove okay this is known as central sulcus okay central sulcus you already know that post central gyrus the elevated area posterior to this central sulcus this iola portion just at the border of the sulcus this is the sensory area area number 312 whereas the anterior portion on the frontal you know lobe lies the motor area okay which is area 4 and area 6 so we'll be concerned with the pre central gyrus this area pre central gyrus okay this side the functions of the brain is given uh in which there is motor function as well you can see various number has been you know allocated to the brain okay these numbers are known as broadman's number broadman's number so he has divided the brain in various uh, regions based on their cyto architecture and functions so as you can see in the green region in the post central gyrus this is the central sulcus this portion is the post central gyrus as i have told you 312 this is a sensory area and pre central gyrus you can see the area number 4 this is the primary motor cortex and with the motor uh, you know activities the area which is just anterior to it area number 6 is also involved so this number 4 is primary motor area and number 6 is pre motor cortex so we are concerned with these two areas for movements so this is the lateral surface and lower diagram is the medial surface you can see these areas also extend in the medial surface which we have just referred to as i told you the primary motor area is area 4 and pre motor area is area 6 what are their gross what are their functions main functions 
the pre-central area or area 4 uh, is the place where all voluntary actions are initiated. So this is the main area for movements. Whereas area number 6 or pre-motor cortex, it uses information from primary motor area and other cortical areas to select a sequence of movements appropriate for intended motor activity as well as adjusting the posture of such movements. So they are responsible for little complex, uh, you know, movements. And also they are responsible for posture and equilibrium maintenance. So we have already seen there are direct pathways. One is pyramidal tract, another is corticobulbar tract. Corticobulbar tract, which innervates the cranial nerve nuclei, not all of them. It includes the third, fourth, and sixth. These are responsible for eye movements, eye movements. Fifth, seventh, eleventh, and twelfth. Okay. So all these, all these are the motor cranial nerves. And since they are coming out of the central nervous system, they are in the periphery. So they are known as lower motor neuron. All the cranial nerves are lower motor neuron. Let me tell you something now that throughout my teaching career, what I have seen, the students uh, will have some confusion about upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron. Though they know what happens with upper motor neuron lesion and lower motor neuron lesion, which they can, you know, easily remember. But when they are asked which one is upper motor neuron, which one is lower motor neuron, they often make mistakes. So therefore, I am emphasizing all the, on this, that all the cranial nerves and all the spinal nerves which remain outside the central nervous system, they are lower motor neuron. Similarly, the corticospinal tract, which originates in the cortex and ends in the spinal cord, they innervate the anterior horn cells of spinal cord. And these are the lower motor neurons because the axon of anterior horn cell will come out as peripheral nerve. So the spinal nerves originating from anterior horn cells are lower motor neuron. So now you will remember about anterior horn cells, anterior horn cells, which are very, very important for motor activities. Because later on, We'll be talking a lot more about anterior horn cells. Now, extrapyramidal tracts, those are direct tracts. Extrapyramidal tracts, as you can see, that uh, they also originate from the cerebral cortex, but this is a multisynaptic pathway. And they also come through basal ganglia and cerebellum. And the major descending extra pyramidal tracts are rubrospinal from red nucleus, tectospinal, okay? These are from colliculi, vestibulospinal from vestibular nucleus, and reticulospinal, reticular nuclei. So these four we must know. There may be others, but we, uh, these four are the major, major extra pyramidal tracts. The extra pyramidal tracts are also upper motor neurons because they are inside the central nervous system. 
and they innervate, they also innervate anterior horn cells of the spinal cord. So anterior horn cell of the spinal cord again is lower motor neuron. You may remember that extra pyramidal tracts are responsible for you know, gross movements, uh, posture, and balancing. Now, once more, uh, this is being re reinforced, upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron. So upper motor neuron, you can see from the cortex, it originates and remain inside the central nervous system, whereas lower motor neuron are the one which emerges outside. So corticospinal, corticobulbar, corticonuclear, and the extrapyramidal tracts, they are all the upper motor neurons. Now we have to know a little bit about the course of the pyramidal tract, how, where it originates and where does it go. So this is, this is important because um, if there is any abnormality with the movement, we may be able to, you know, identify which of the tracts or where in the tract uh, there is some problem, there is some lesion, okay? So corticospinal tract, as we can see, they mostly originate from the primary motor cortex but it can originate from premotor cortex and interestingly, few fibers may come from the sensory area as well. Now thick myelinated fibers arising from the giant cell of base located in the primary motor cortex constitute the most important component of corticospinal tract. If we think about corticospinal tract, we must think that it is coming from area number four, okay, pre-central gyrus, a primary motor cortex. Now, once they are formed, they will converge and pass through a, you know, narrow area. So this area, this is known as internal capsule. One side you can see Thalamus, isn't it? There are basal ganglia. So anyway, <clears throat> it passes through the internal capsule and then it descends through the brainstem. Brainstem means there will be midbrain, then pons, and then medulla. Through the brainstem, it will descend and then it will divide into, in the medulla itself, it will divide into two branches. The major branch where 80% of the fibers are there, they will cross to the opposite side and then they will supply the muscles uh, or, or they, will, they will supply the anterior horn cells at all levels of the spinal cord, isn't it? Twenty percent of them will remain on the same side. So this is known as anterior corticospinal tract. The crossed one to the other side is known as lateral corticospinal tract. So the uncrossed one, they will also cross to the opposite side, but very near to their termination. Okay, so there are two tracks actually, but ultimately the vast majority of them will supply the muscle of the opposite side. Okay, so their connection is contralateral, not ipsilateral. And therefore, if there is any lesion in any part, the most common lesion occurs here, vascular lesion, okay? Uh, stoppage of blood supply in the internal capsule. If, if it happens to the left side, 
then there will be paralysis on the right side okay not on the same side because all these fibers are going to cross to the opposite side now this picture is also familiar to you you, you have just seen uh, what does it show in the motor cortex a large portion of the motor cortex is dedicated to the facial region. You can see the tongue. You can see the lips. And a smaller area is dedicated to the limbs and the trunk. But in the limbs and the trunk, again, you will see the area which is responsible for fine movements skilled movements they are represented in much larger area okay and if you combine all these things together the, the motor homunculus will look something like this okay so that means the cortex uh, supplies far more fibers to the you know head region particularly the lips tongue etc because there will be skilled movement like uh, vocalization, your, your, uh, your speech, you are talking, and that needs the concerted activity of a very large number of fibers. Similarly, you are writing or doing many skillful work with your hand. So this uh, area, hand area is represented in a very large portion of the cerebral cortex extra pyramidal tract as i have told you this is multisynaptic and what are their functions they help to provide appropriate and stable postural background for the muscle activity and they support the function of the pyramidal tract support means if you are writing something you cannot do it walking isn't it at that time to support the pyramidal system work uh, this extra pyramidal system <coughs> must assume a static and very stable posture so these are the extra pyramidal tracts. This is the simplified diagram. This is rubrospinal, so this is the red nucleus, OK? And from the red nucleus, it crosses to the opposite side and descends and ultimately supplies the anterior horn cell. This is the reticulospinal. Of course, the reticulospinal has got Pontine reticulospinal and uh, medullary reticulospinal. And they are called reticulospinal because there are uh, many scattered nuclei from where these tracts originate and around the core of the, you know, each level. And they descend and supplies the anterior horn cell again but one of them uh, the pontine one is stimulatory type whereas the medullary one is inhibitory type particularly for the muscle tone <clears throat> they play very important role in maintenance of muscle tone and posture <clears throat> then again, we have vestibular spinal tract, which originate in the vestibular apparatus, oh, sorry, vestibular nucleus, vestibular nucleus, and descend to the anterior horn cell. You will know much more about it when you know uh, the details will be taught to you. To understand, the motor activities since i have told you about the 
posture and many other you know background activities we must know about the muscle tone <clears throat> see what is muscle tone that means the tension inside the muscle a muscle has a basal tone so muscle is not if you if you feel the muscle you will see that it is not very uh, you know it 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 has got some tightness in it tightness in it okay uh, so when a person dies then there won't be any muscle tone when a when a person sleeps in the night at that time the muscle tone will be decreased it will not completely abolish so that means the muscle maintain a tightness that is because of partial contraction of the muscle asynchronous contraction of the muscle okay one small group of muscle will be contracting and next moment another group will be contracting uh, so there will be certain uh, basic contraction which is maintained which makes the muscle tone and uh, let us see what are the reasons see the passive stretch of course in clinical skill you will learn all these things one is there are there are two types of contraction muscle contraction one is active contraction which you are doing yourself isn't it another active contraction or relaxation or you may say that you are flexing your arm or you are stretching your arm so these are done by you so these are the active movements whereas if you do not move another examiner which is sitting in front of you he say he says to you relax and he just folds your arm and unfolds then he will be able to understand that how much is your muscle tone what is it how does it know resistance will be offered it will not be like a dead tissue so resistance is slight and uniform in basal condition if it is like this then your muscle tone is normal why this resistance is there firstly the elastic property of the muscle and joints and secondly the most important thing the basal degree of discharge of the anterior horn cells anterior horn cells are of two types we are going to see alpha motor neuron and gamma motor neuron so alpha motor neuron never sleeps they continuously discharge okay the basal level of discharge will make this muscle tone during relaxation and sleep the alpha motor neuron discharge falls while during alertness and anxiety the muscle tone increases so we have the terms like hypertonia and hypotonia hypertonia means when the muscle tone is high okay again a, a examiner will be able to tell you whether your muscle tone is high or your muscle tone is low hypertonia is due to an increased alpha motor neuron discharge which keeps your muscle contracted clinically hypertonia or which can be spasticity or rigidity it occurs with dis with disorders of descending pathways that normally inhibit alpha motor neuron okay so that means if the inhibition of the alpha motor neuron is withdrawn then alpha motor discharge will increase and this will cause rigidity okay hypertonia what is spasticity spasticity is a form of hypertonia in which muscle become hypertonic only when they are stretched a bit 
Now, here, so long we are talking about the anterior horn cells. Now, here, there are two types of functional, two functional types of anterior horn cells. Okay? One is lateral group, another is medial group. See, this is medial group and this is lateral group. Lateral group is mainly concerned with fine movements. So where does it go? It goes to the distal part of your limbs and in the head region, uh, in the face, for example. And this, these go to the axial muscles, your trunk muscles and the proximal muscles of the limb. Okay. So this is supplied by the extra pyramidal fibers and the lateral is supplied by corticospinal fibers. In this diagram, I'm emphasizing, I do not see to the right side, we are coming to them later on. In this diagram, I'm going to emphasize here, the descending tracts are coming. Some of them are ending on alpha motor, neuron. This is alpha motor neuron. And these are mainly corticospinal tract. Among the extrapyramidal fibers, rubrospinal also comes here. Whereas all other descending tracts, the extrapyramidal tracts like tectospinal, uh, reticulospinal, vestibulospinal, they end, end on Gamma motor neuron. Oh, sorry. They, this is alpha motor neuron and this is gamma motor neuron. Okay. Uh, alpha motor neuron actually makes contraction of the muscle, whereas gamma motor neuron, when their discharge increases, they usually increase the muscle tone. So to appreciate the movements, you know, we must know something about the reflex. So this is the, uh, you know, typical reflex arc, component of the reflex. It starts with the receptor, then goes with the afferent nerve, enter through the posterior column then it comes back to the anterior column or okay anterior horn cell and then it goes out as a motor nerve and supplies the muscle so these are the components of reflex arc so if there is a discharge the muscle will contract most important thing regarding the motor physiology, uh, to assess the motor physiology, stretch reflex is important. What is stretch reflex? When a skeletal muscle of with intact innervation is stretched, it reflexly responds by contraction. If you stretch a muscle, it will contract by itself. Why? Because when you stretch the muscle, there are some receptors here, which is known as muscle spindle. It will also be stretched. They're very sensitive. So the moment they are stretched, they will send impulses through the afferent nerve. This is known as group 1A afferent. And this will end monosynaptically without any other involvement of any other neuron to the alpha motor neuron. Then alpha motor neuron discharge will increase and this will cause the contraction of the whole muscle. So when you stretch a muscle, it will contract. So that is what is known as stretch reflex. You will learn much more about it when you are attending your classes. Now here, one of the classical example of the stretch reflex, what you have to do in your lab is the knee jerk. Okay, when you put a nip hammer and tap the tendon, what happens? 
the quadriceps muscle gets stretched. All of a sudden, it will get stretched. And that is muscle spindle here, you can see. It will get stimulated. It will send sensory impulse and monosynaptically connect with the uh, anterior horn cell of the same muscle. OK? So now the muscle will contract. If the muscle contracts, quadricep muscle is contracts, then there will be extension of the knee. Knee will jerk upward. This you will practice. Okay, so this is what is stretch reflex. Why we are talking so much about the stretch reflex? There are clinical application of the stretch reflex. Okay. Uh, In the spastic muscles, offer high resistance to passive stretch. Okay, let us see tendon jerk. What happens when the excitability of the motor neuron is altered in different pathological conditions? The tendon reflexes are either depressed or exaggerated. If you see that the response is not normal, it is more than normal or less than normal then you will know that there is some pathological condition, some lesion. When it is exaggerated, then it is an indication that the gamma motor neuron activity or discharge has increased. And if it is not exaggerated, it is otherwise, if it is depressed, then it will indicate the decreased gamma motor neuron activity. Now, what you can test with the stretch reflex? Whether your afferent pathway is intact, if there is tabis dorsalis, then the stretch reflex will be absent uh, or reduced. The anterior horn cell, if there is any lesion, uh, so what we call lower motor neuron disease, or which happens in polio, poliomyelitis, then also there will be no reflex or reduced implex, uh, you know, knee jerk. Both afferent and efferent pathways, when they're in fault, then also same thing will happen, which happens in peripheral neuropathy. So this is when they're depressed. And if it is exaggerated, which we call hyperreflexia, and as it has been mentioned, increased gamma motor discharge, physiologically it can happen in anxiety and nervousness, pathologically it can happen in thyrotoxicosis and upper motor neuron lesion. Now, this is a very common pathological condition which uh, that is, everybody knows about the paralysis, isn't it? So we call it hemiplegia. Hemiplegia means half of the body, right half or the left half of the body is paralyzed. Okay? Uh, as I have told you uh, at the time of uh, pyramidal tract description, that there is the most common place of vascular lesion is the internal capsule. If that happens, if it happens on the right internal capsule, then there will be paralysis of the left side of the body. So that means the left limb and left uh, upper limb and lower limb will be paralyzed, as you can see in the first diagram. Okay. And uh, there are other kind of lesions which you are seeing here that we'll discuss later on. Paraplegia. Paraplegia is this portion. The pale portion is, uh, you know, paralyzed. The blue is intact portion. Okay. Paraplegia means when the lower limbs are paralyzed. 
this happens in the spinal cord lesion when it is below the cervical level and if the whole all of them are involved all the limbs are involved then it is known as quadriplegia or tetraplegia so this happens if uh, the spinal cord upper part of the you know upper region cervical region of the spinal cord is there is lesion now we are coming to something very interesting babinski sign uh, the knee jerk what we told this was that was a deep reflex okay tendon reflex all tendon reflexes are deep reflex because tendon are a little deeper structure it is the the tendon deep structure but if the reflex is aroused from the skin then it is a superficial reflex so here what is what is happening here the sole of the feet is being scratched so the lateral portion of the sole of the feet when you scratch it like this then the normal response is toes will go down there will be dorsiflexion okay so this is the normal response but if the upper motor neuron lesion the cortico spinal tract if there is lesion then if you do the same thing what you will see instead of flexion there will be extension you know of the big toe and fanning out of the other toes okay so this is what we call babinski sign so babinski sign uh, indicates that there is lesion in the pyramidal tract okay so this is a superficial reflex anyway we we have the scope of lot of discussion on it but this much is enough today uh, so these are very common things which are which are you know asked in the vibhavoshi prominent signs of upper motor neuron lesion what happens there is hypotonia sorry sorry there is hypertonia spastic paralysis and no movement no movement no muscle movement but there is no muscle atrophy so these are the features of upper motor neuron lesion muscle tone is increased uh, paralysis with increased muscle tone and paralysis means there is no muscle movement no voluntary movement some amount of muscle atrophy may occur because of disuse because you cannot move so there will be disuse atrophy but that is slight so <clears throat> the prominent signs of upper motor neuron lesion as it has been mentioned loss of voluntary control spasticity rigidity clasp knife rigidity superficial reflexes like abdominal cremasteric reflexes they are absent deep reflexes like bicep jerk knee jerk ankle jerk they are exaggerated plantar reflex is abnormal so babinski sign is positive all these things happen in upper motor neuron lesion if the direct pathway and indirect pathway okay pyramidal and extra pyramidal pathway all are lesion but if you specifically lesion pyramidal tract lesion then 1 4 and 6 loss of voluntary control superficial reflexes will be lost plantar reflex will be positive babinski sign will be positive 
and extrapyramidal lesion, if it happens, then there will be two, three, and five. That means spasticity, clasp knife rigidity, and deep reflexes are exaggerated. Prominent signs of lower motor neuron lesion. Just now, what we discussed is upper motor neuron lesion, pyramidal and extrapyramidal lesion. But if the lower motor neuron lesion happens, then <clears throat> what are the features? See, lower motor neuron involves the alpha motor neuron in case of spinal cord. So if the nerve is gone, naturally, there is nothing to innervate the effector organ. So as a matter of fact, reflex will not be there. Okay, the reflexes will be absent. And muscle tone will not be there because no alpha motor neuron discharge, isn't it? And let us see. There will be atonia, loss of muscle tone, flaccid paralysis, okay? Without muscle tone paralysis, but not rigid, it is flaccid. Progressive muscle atrophy, because if there is no nerve, okay, uh, that is muscle, the nerve is nutritive to the muscle. Without nerve, the muscle cannot maintain its normal shape and size. So there will be a lot of wasting. Our reflex here, no reflex, no reflex because one component of the reflex arc is lost. There will be muscle fasciculation. Spontaneous slow twitch will start and denervation hypersensitivity. Okay. Now let us see spinal cord injury. If there are spinal cord injury, there will be uh, either paraplegia or quadriplegia. Okay. So if the lesion is C10 level, about C10 level, then we'll get paraplegia. The upper portion is paired. Uh, sorry, T10, yeah, <coughs> thoracic 10. Whereas, if it is in C4 level, there will be quadriplegia. All four limbs will be involved. But, you know, the phrenic nerve comes out from C3, C4, C5. So, therefore, you should be careful. If such injury occurs, the person may need or will need assisted respiration. So higher the spinal cord injury, more dysfunctional will be the body. Now this is what is brown sequard syndrome. This is interesting because this is one half of the spinal cord injury is there. You can see the upper segment, the spinal cord is injured, okay? So whatever tract, uh, is passing through it will get severed on one side. So there will be no loss above above the lesion, but below the lesion, all the tracts which pass through this cut region, lesion region, will get severed and their functions will be lost. So when you have the idea of the course of different, uh, you know, sensory and motor tracts in the spinal cord, then it is easy. As far as motor is concerned, I told you, most of the, you know, fibers, they will cross to the opposite side in the medulla level itself, right? So therefore, if 
in the spinal cord that is lesion in the they they now are in the same site okay it's pyramidal tract you see the pyramidal tract on the same site so there will be motor loss more motor loss few of the anterior uh, corticospinal tract may be spared but the whole of the lateral column tracts lateral uh, you know sp uh, corticospinal tract will be destroyed so there will be more motor loss but there will be less sensory loss because and the uh, sensory uh, information particularly the spinothalamic tracts they will cross to the opposite side on the same level uh, of the spinal cord and then ascend so the, there will be less sensory loss and more motor loss on the same side and opposite thing will happen that means on the opposite side there will be no motor loss or less motor loss and more sensory loss so this is the position of the you know tracts in the spinal cord okay they are shown so that you can understand if one side is lesioned what are the tracts which are going to be affected now quickly we'll go through the other so long we have talked about the cortex but at the beginning we told you i told you that there are other structures which are involved like uh, cerebellum basal ganglia etc so in case of cerebellum you see that there are three portions functional portion one is floccular nodular lobe which is the vestibular cerebellum second one the medial portion of the cerebellum which is known as spinal cerebellum and lastly the lateral portion these two portions they are known as neo cerebellum okay so what are the functions of vestibular cerebellum uh, it is concerned with coordination of the movements okay it also maintains the balance of the body now this portion the spinal cerebellum what is its function uh, spinal cerebellum will will deal a little later we'll first talk about the you know neo cerebellum okay large portion of cerebellum neo cerebellum neo cerebellum helps in the planning and programming of the movements and it is also concerned with complex and sequential movement so regarding spinal cerebellum you can see there are several connections with the motor cortex and even the sensory organs sensory organs so what cerebellum does so i told you the all uh, motor activities hmm, or mo all motor signals will start from the cortex so from the cortex it goes through the spinocerebellar sorry uh, corticospinal tract okay to the muscles but it gives a collateral to the cerebellum this is cortico ponto cerebellar connection so cerebellar gets a picture of the intention of the cortex and then when the movement is on say at that time the from the sensory receptors okay proprioceptors it will get a picture of what is happening so it has got two pictures one is intention of the cortex and second one is performance and the mismatch it will calculate and then send the impulse to the cortex to correct it okay it will send the impulse through dentato 
uh, rubro thalamocortical connection okay and then this discharge will be corrected and there will be precise movement as i told you earlier that uh, what it does that it corrects the rate of contraction the range of contraction the direction of con contraction and the force of contraction just imagine you are a in the cricket you are a sleep fielder and when, and within short time the ball will pass you but you have to make accurate movement it must be your rate of movement range of movement direction of movement and force of movement must be precise to for successful you know completion of the catch so this is what the spinal cerebellum does cerebellar syndrome uh, includes ataxia ataxia means in coordination in movement and it is uh, reflected by dysmetria always the measurement is poor that means if you are asking that uh, person to touch the nose tip of the nose after closing his eyes he will unable to do that because it will go elsewhere okay in coordinated movement decomposition of movement which is known as dysdiadokinesia dysdiadokinesia what does it mean complex movement for example alternative movements like pronation and supination of the uh, arm uh, of the you know hand he will not be able to perform second one very classical symptom is intention tremor whenever he is trying to do something there will be tremors he is trying to catch something he is trying to hold something from the table pick up something from the table at that time there will be lot of tremor okay third is atonia because the muscle tone will be reduced slurred speech because of lack of coordination his speech will not be very clear nystagmus is ab abnormal movement of the eyeball in deep reflexes the knee jerk is characteristically pendular we are we are going to basal ganglia just two slides on this this includes the caudate nucleus putum and globus pallidus these three are the part of the basal ganglia and there are related functionally related structures like subthalamic nucleus and substantia nigra its function is planning and programming like the lateral cerebellum this also start discharging before the movement starts that means their planning and programming occurs in three areas one is basal ganglia another is uh, cerebellum the lateral cerebellum uh, you know neo cerebellum and third one is the association cortex then its second function is regulation of tone and posture this is very evident if there is any abnormality of the basal ganglia uh, then there will be lot you know muscle tone will be different muscle tone there will be rigidity and there will be lot of signs you know which will show there is something wrong with the posture and of course cognitive functions will also get affected see the lesion the most classical one is the left side which is known as parkinsonism parkinsonism is mainly because of you know nigrostriel pathway hmm? which is a dopaminergic pathway when uh, there is atrophy of this pathway at that time what will happen uh, there will be classical features of parkinsonism will be seen 
in lot of elderly people you can see if you watch closely many of them they are suffering from parkinsonism firstly there will be bradykinesia that means less movement uh, poverty of movement mask like face that means facial expression will be very poor whether they are happy or they are sad it is difficult to understand thirdly as i told you rigidity is there and one of the interesting features is tremor and the pill rolling movement particularly the fingers you know they will always move as if they are rolling the pill but this kind of tremor will disappear during activity so this is just opposite with that of the cerebellar lesion cerebellar lesion is intention tremor when you try to do something at that time there will be tremor will appear but during rest there is no tremor here the tremor is at rest okay again if there is uh, lesion in the putamen there will be chorea chorea is something like spontaneous jerky irregular movement or there could be atetosis if there is lesion in the globus pallidus uh this is slow confluent reading or twisting type of movement and lastly if subthalamus uh, lesion is there there will be hemiballismus which is quite you know violent type of movement now another apparatus another uh, structure which is very very important for motor purposes is vestibular apparatus this is the balancing apparatus we call uh, this is in the inner ear you can see the cochlea which is responsible for hearing and then we have this vestibular apparatus which has got three semicircular canal one utricle and one saccule so what they they sense the movement and they adjust the position of the head and the body appropriately so that the person can maintain his balance it has got several connections with the uh, of course this is uh, the inputs go through um, vestibular nucleus okay the eighth cranial nerve emerge from here enters in the central nervous system and there is cochlea and vestibular nucleus anyway it uh, the balancing apparatus in uh, inputs they go to the vestibular nucleus from there it moves upward and downward downward movement you know vestibulo spinal tract vestibulo spinal tract which is a reticular tract oh, sorry which is a extra pyramidal tract sir uh, i may request you to little uh, i mean be a little oh. faster okay okay this is this is uh, I, I i understand this is the last slide okay this is the last slide so this shows the organization of motor system whatever we talk today the whole thing is summarized here so if you keep this thing in your mind you have a you know you have a good uh, control on your motor system uh, knowledge of the motor system good grip so voluntary activity is planned in the association cortex the basal ganglia and the lateral portion of the cerebellum okay and where does it go it makes feedback connection with the premotor and motor cortex for organizing the voluntary movement now the movement is initiated second second place we come here the movement is commands are sent through the cortico spinal cortico bulbar and cortico nuclear system okay 
upper motor neurons. Then the posture before and during movement is adjusted by descending brainstem or extrapyramidal pathways and peripheral afferents. So for posture, it is the extrapyramidal pathway. Movements are smoothened and coordinated by the cerebellum and its connection. As I told you about that rate, range, direction, and force of movement. I think that's all <clears throat> with me, from me. Thank you very much. My sincere thanks. My sincere thanks to Professor mm -hmm. Shumita Bhogosh for an enlightening presentation. Your expertise has enriched the minds of our students and enthusiasts alike, surpassing the boundaries of the motor nervous system. Thank you so much, sir, for your invaluable contributions. Now, we eagerly welcome Professor Arjun Mitmaitro to bring this session to a remarkable close. Your wisdom, Professor Maitro, will surely leave a lasting impression. Thank you, sir. Okay. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Sanita. Uh, I'm here to wrap up the session for today. Uh, so it's a it's a wonderful journey. It's a wonderful voyage uh, of through the ocean of knowledge, and we get so uh, enriched teacher with us. So I'm. Uh, really thankful to be the part of this academic journey started by the Physiological Society of India and I thank all the coordinators and organizers who painstakingly uh, go through everything and slides and prepare the, these shows. It is always a delight to hear from the best of the industries and when uh, these bests are close to us then it gives us immense pleasure. We become so happy that our seniors, our, our colleagues, our, uh, we are learning from them and we are sharing our knowledge. <clears throat> so I personally thank uh, Dr. Suchitra Sachin Palve and Dr. Sumita Bhagos sir uh, for giving the time to enlighten our student to make the, the most complex system that is the nervous system and demystifying the facts in uh, such a simple manner and i sincerely hope that the students will get a lot of benefit from these lectures if they follow and not only that uh, when they will start with their uh, text uh, and, and when they start with their actual study of nervous system many of the things which initially uh, we feel very tough will become easy for this early uh, exposure and uh, you know uh, I, I i also like to inform you that that our journey continues and the next session uh, that is the 10th session will be on the 27th of april uh, 2024 where uh, we have two eminent uh, physiologist speaker uh, who will be talking about the what do you call uh, special senses so Dr. Arnab Das, who is an assistant professor in Ramakrishna Mission Vivekananda Educational Research Institute, will give us an overview of special senses, particularly the auditory and olfactory system. And the other speaker is uh, Proshenjit Choudhury uh, from Government General Degree College, Mohanpur, Medinipur, who will give his talk on uh, From Seeing to Severing, uh, Demystifying Vision and Gustation. So obviously we'll be looking forward to these two wonderful talk 
that is going to take place on uh, 27th of April 2024. So please uh, mark it on calendar, be there and enjoy these. So again, I thank everyone, every audience, every organizers uh, and the speakers from the bottom of my heart. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sanita. You won did a wonderful job today and everything was perfect. And I'm very happy that uh, I could become a part of this uh, session. Thank you.